Sorry to be late. Better get this show on the road. I know Leon has somewhere to be at three o'clock, so. <laughs> he does. You don't know? Today's a semifinal of the Euros, Spain versus France. I believe that Leon's tracking that. Believe, I believe that Leon is tracking that very closely. Team handball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Matt, I thought you were much more international than that. Uh, I'm more international <laughs> when it comes to cricket. Fair. <laughs> Fair enough. I don't need to start, so. No? All right. Uh, let's start with NATO um, and, and the summit. So the Secretary has had a couple meetings today um, already. Uh, you know, I guess summit hasn't yet kicked off, but will um, tonight. Um, are you aware that he has heard any concerns from the people that he's spoken to so far about uh, President Biden? No, I'm not aware of uh, him, him having heard any concerns. Have you as asked a or are you uh, deliberately we did, we, trying to avoid we, I talked to him an hour ago and he did not mention having any concerns with anyone. Yeah. Or I'm sorry, did not, did not mention having heard concerns from anyone. So he has his own concerns. No, <laughs> that, is, that is not a fair implication. No, oh, okay. well, he, spoke, just, he has spoken to, to this sure. quite clearly. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, but I mean, does that mean? Do you know if uh, they've come up? Have they come up with? Uh, they have not. Anyone else? They have not come up in. Well, I can't speak for anyone else all, all around the government, obviously. But no, I'm not aware of anyone raising concerns with the secretary or anyone else from the State Department uh, about the president. About the president. What we consistently hear from allies and partners around the world when we travel the world and when people come here is that they are grateful for the leadership the president has shown um, in this case when we talk about nato in expanding nato and convincing allies to raise their collective support for nato's uh, defense and deterrence measures uh, and his leadership in rallying an international coalition to push back on russia's aggression in ukraine among many other foreign policy measures uh, okay, and then uh, are, is, is there any uh, State Department component to the aid package that's supposed to be announced today that you're aware of? Um, so I don't want to get it. It's a nice way to try to get me into uh, talking about something that has not yet been announced. So, but I, but, are, but so, let me so put, I will. Uh, let, let me, me, let, me way, let me answer it ellip elliptically. So, uh, <laughs> elliptically. elliptically. So um, there will be. New air defense capabilities announced uh, during this summit, both by the United States and by other countries. There will be other new defense commitments uh, announced, and of course, the State Department does play a role in in uh, in all of those. Right. Well, uh, other than the, I mean, I think that in this me uh, event this morning, he said that something about seven million dollars in protective gear equipment for um, Ukrainian women's uh, mm -hmm. armed forces. Is there a so you're saying that beyond that, there will or be beyond the U.S. component of of that, there will be more from state. Yeah, we will be coming. we will be announcing across the government. Some of that will include State Department components, political, economic, um, and military measures to support Ukraine. Thank you. Just yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, go ahead. The seven million. Sorry, about just the seven million secretary said he said uh, NATO countries. So how many? How much? Is Let me get details to you uh, offline. Okay. I have okay. an second. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if uh, you have any, uh, if the final communique has been final, finalized or definitively, um, the wording that uh, the NATO summit leaders would give to Ukraine on this bridge, you guys call it a bridge to, to membership. Uh, there's talks of some capitals, the Baltic states so specifically, they want the word irreversible in the final communique. Uh, my understanding that it's been negotiated. Can you say where it stands? I don't want to. I obviously don't want to say what the final communique will say. There are pieces of the communique that continue to be worked on and negotiated, which is usual for the summit, right? There are a lot. There's a lot that comes in those NATO communiques. You've seen them before, and some of that goes right up to the last minute. I will say that a significant amount of time has gone into discussions about the um, uh, wording about Ukraine's path to membership. The secretary talked with President Zelensky directly about this when we were in Ukraine several months ago. It was a significant comp uh, portion of discussion at the NATO foreign ministers meeting last month that the secretary attended in Prague. Uh, and of course, it has been the subject of ongoing discussions uh, uh, between our building and other NATO members. And of course, Julie Smith, our ambassador to NATO, being in the, in the lead on that over the past few weeks. Uh, I will say, I think we have landed in a place, uh, and you will all see this when the, the language comes forward. Um, uh, 
that makes clear, as we have said, that NATO's future, I'm sorry, that Ukraine's future is in NATO. And the communique will make that very clear, and you'll all get to see the language and talk about it when it's publicly released. I mean, is it still being negotiated, to your knowledge? Uh, there may be pieces of that, that part we have largely, I will just say that language we have largely settled on. There are other pieces of the communique, and maybe some smaller pieces of, the, of that piece of it that we're still negotiating that as well. Part of it is that part is, is largely settled, yeah. Say. Thank you. Can I move on? Yeah. OK. Uh, I, didn't I, think you, I didn't think you were going to ask me a NATO question when I called I, on you. So. I, I do have my NATO question, but let's <laughs> talk about Gaza. Okay. <clears throat> uh, anyway, um, are you aware of uh, the Lancet uh, Group report? It's a medical magazine, British medical magazine, that estimated the deaths as a result of the war in Gaza to be 186,000. And it, of course, it's taken into account, uh, the expert took into account and indirect deaths, you know, that have happened thus far and may happen as a result of the war, including disease and other things and starvation. So I have, that? I have seen the report, and I will just say whatever the number of civilians that have actually died as a result of this conflict, we know that it's far too many. Yeah. And far too many civilians have been needlessly killed as a result of this conflict. And that is why we are working so hard, including negotiations that are going on this week to try to reach a ceasefire that would alleviate the suffering in Gaza, that would bring home the hostages that continue to be held, uh, and ultimately put us on a path to hopefully ending the war. So are you concerned that you know the, the figures could be far more staggering than what we've seen uh, published by, let's say, the Ministry of Health in, in Gaza? I mean, you know, I remember early on, the Assistant Secretary of State, Barbara Lee, said, told the, I guess one of the committees uh, on Capitol Hill that uh, the death may actually be more than what the, the, the ministry, the, the health ministry, I'm not sure. Saying, the, the death toll could very well be more. We know there are potentially people who are under rubble who have not been counted. But it goes to my, the point I was making, whatever the number is, the reported number already is far too high. The reported number already is unacceptable. Um, the number of civilian deaths. So, of course, something higher than that would just be further tragedy. But we long ago passed the stage um, uh, uh, where uh, I, I should, th this has been a, a, a horrific human tragedy for You're some time. You're I, uh, you excuse, that. Excuse, excuse, go ahead with another question. Yeah. So okay. I, 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 I absolutely not. I'm not, gonna, I'm not, I'm not even going to entertain that. I'm not, I'm not even going to entertain that. Said, go ahead with another question. Thank you. It's ridiculous. I wanted to ask you about the status of the talks. I know yesterday you said, and, and uh, Kirby at the White House, your colleague at the White House said uh, that, you know, that you are a bit optimistic, although there are gaps. Do, uh, are we any closer today? Do you have any assessment as where, to, where we are today and so on? And, uh, of course, uh, Hamas is saying that the latest Israeli attack actually may, you know, may uh, jeopardize ceasefire talks. Uh, so. I, as I said yesterday, neither want to negotiate in public, nor do I kind of want to offer ongoing daily assessments of where the, pro the talks stand. As we said last, we last week, when we got the proposal back from Hamas, we saw room for progress um, uh, and room for hope that we could reach a ceasefire. And we continue to work hard to pursue a ceasefire because of, as I said, the immense ongoing suffering in Gaza that we want to alleviate, which we know a ceasefire is the best path uh, to accomplishing. And my last question now, uh, the Israeli Prime Minister is expected to come to the city in two weeks uh, and so on. Uh, is it your assessment that he actually would come and speak before Congress if a deal has not been arrived to? What, what is your assessment of his visit? And will he, let's say, be received at the State Department? I don't have any independent assessment to offer whether he'll come or not. All I can tell you is Congress has invited him and he has accepted the invitation. I have no reason to think that he won't come. As to any meetings with the uh, executive branch, I don't have anything to announce today. Thank you. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, any update on the negotiations with, uh, with the Hezbollah also? No, I spoke to this some yesterday. It remains our assessment that the, the best way to reach calm in the north is to get a ceasefire in Gaza. Uh, it's not to say it's the only way. We continue to pursue diplomacy to resolve the conflict uh, in northern Israel and southern Lebanon and try to de-escalate the conflict and keep, keep tensions from rising further. Um, but that 
remains a very tough goal as long as the conflict in Gaza continues to wage. And so um, we do, and you heard the president say this when he outlined the ceasefire proposal several weeks ago, that we do can believe, we believe then and we continue to believe that the best way to, to find a path to calm in the north is to first achieve a ceasefire in Gaza. <coughs> yeah. Uh, in the region. Yeah. Um, it's been over a month since the U.S. detained, or sorry, it's been over a month since the Houthis detained. Um, dozens of uh, locally, dozens of UN staff and civil society members, um, as well as lo former locally employed staff from the US Embassy in Yemen. Um, do you have any update on US efforts to secure their release or uh, hold the Houthis accountable for their attacks in the Red Sea? So first of all, we condemn the Houthis' wrongful detentions uh, and once again call on them to release all detainees, including the uh, United Nations diplomatic and non-governmental organization staff that they detained last month. Uh, we will not rest until all detainees are released. I can tell you that the Secretary personally has discussed this matter with uh, partners in the region. Um, uh, with a number of countries to impress upon everyone that is important that the Houthis release these workers who have nothing to do with the conflict in Gaza. There is no reason that they should have been detained in the same way that the Houthis attacks on international shipping have nothing to do with the war in Gaza. Um, so do their detentions of uh, aid workers and, and others. So. Um, I will just say that through these actions, these attacks that the Houthis continue to launch, they are alienating the world community and putting the peace process in Yemen, which, which parties, including the Houthis, have painstakingly negotiated over the last two years in jeopardy. And so we will continue to impress upon them through all available channels that they should stop their attacks and they should release all of the workers that they are detaining. Uh, Simon. Um, could we, uh, just staying on, uh, well, in the region on, on Gaza that um, supposed to be talks in Doha uh, tomorrow. Um, is there any sort of update from, from the US side that you can give us on the, on the possibility of a, of a hostage deal? Um, you know, there's been some positive talk last week, but you know, are we any closer to, to getting a deal? I kind of answered this with, with, with to Saeed's question. I don't really want to offer a daily kind of assessment of how the talks are going, other than that we are working on them. Um, you know, a lot of this proposal has been agreed to for some time. When you think about the uh, proposals, maybe not the right word, but when you think about the outstanding issues or the issues that would be encompassed in uh, any kind of ceasefire, a number of them have been essentially agreed on, maybe some fine points to be worked out for some time, and we have been down to for some time some of, much, some of the much harder issues and much stickier issues, and that continues to be the case. We have made progress. We certainly think we're closer to a deal than we were uh, a few weeks ago, but that doesn't mean we'll get one. Um, you've heard the Secretary say before that oftentimes in, in these types of negotiations, the issues that are saved for the end are the hardest ones, and so even when a deal seems within reach, it doesn't mean you're going to get one. Um, all we can do is continue to make clear that this deal is in the interests of Israel, it's in the interests of the Palestinian people uh, in Gaza, uh, it would alleviate the suffering of the Palestinian people in Gaza, so we hope we're able to come to an agreement uh, as soon as possible. Um, and we've seen, there's been some reporting that uh, Arab foreign ministers uh, have been invited to the NATO summit. Um, I think there's an Israeli delegation here, is there anything you can say about, about um, who's here, whether the secretary will meet with them, and also what the, the um, what, how much that the, the Gaza situation, the Israel-Palestinian situation will be part of the talks. Or yeah, things. so obviously you have um, NATO members who are in town, and then you have the heads of state of four other countries who are uh, partners of NATO. That includes Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the Republic of Korea. And then there are uh, foreign ministers in town from other NATO countries, uh, Israel, Algeria, Bahrain, Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Mauritania, Morocco, Qatar, Tunisia, and UAE. Actually did happen to have the list right here. Um, and yes, the secretary uh, and other members of the government will be meeting with uh, with them as when they are in town. And yes, I would I would certainly expect, to, to your question about the, the topics, I would certainly expect that the conflict in Gaza will be something that's discussed. Uh, and not just the work to achieve a ceasefire, but the ongoing work that we are doing to try and develop robust plans for the day after the conflict to establish governance and security that would give us a path to lasting peace, security, and stability for the region. And I will note that even while that work is going on here, 
Barbara Lee, our assistant secretary, is traveling in the region right now, meeting with counterparts to advance that the, the uh, those same lines of effort. So, is there a separate? Is there a meeting involving uh, Secretary Blinken and those those uh, Middle Eastern? foreign ministers, including the Israelis, is that they're all in, in one meeting that's going to be discussing that? I'm not aware, I, I'm not aware of, any, uh, of any such meeting. We have several bilats and different meetings, but I'm not aware of one meeting with those foreign partners just focused on Gaza. It may be that there's something that's part of the overall summit that, that, that they're involved, but uh, uh, I'm not aware but of it. Did, can I, just to clarify on that? Yeah. When you mentioned a list of non-NATO countries, you, I think you did say the secretary would be meeting them. So, but just to clarify, no, no, not necessarily with all of them. Secretary, no, others in the government. That's, these are all these are people yeah. who were invited to be in town that will be participating right. in different NATO events. Some of the uh, some of the side yeah. events that go on, and that some of those there will be bilateral meetings that happen here. Some at the White House, some at the Defense Department. The, the usual thing that happens on the margins of these types of summits. There's not one meeting organized around all of them. I would expect nothing less, Matt. So these are not all heads of state, right? No, I said these In are four. The I think I said foreign ministers. There were four heads, no, four, no. heads of state from four countries, yeah, yeah, uh, no. heads of government. Yes, yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, the head of, the thank head of state heads of, of state, of, heads of, of state. Australia is uh, heads of state and heads of government. And, I should. And in fact, the Australian Prime Minister is not coming. It's I, his deputy. I should have said. Uh, and the head of state. Of heads Japan of state uh, is the emperor, not. <laughs> <laughs> Prime Minister. So I, let's, let's, I appreciate look, the correction. You, you know, no, look, <laughs> you guys record. exist on protocol. I, 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 it, is a, it is a fair point. I very much take the point. But just, to, just to come back. <laughs> so it, there, was a, there will be bilateral meetings between Secretary or other U.S. officials and those countries where you'll talk about the future of Gaza. That's, that's, that's on the agenda. I can't say with every one of those countries I listed who have been invited, but yes, with uh, a number of those countries, there'll be meetings going on. Yes, that'll be, uh, that'll be part of and, the agenda. Are you hoping for the uh, NATO as a whole to express some view on on uh, the the conflict in Gaza? You know, particularly, are, are you expecting, or are you hoping that that NATO leaders will endorse uh, a, a, a peace deal and uh, hostage for peace? Let deal. me defer that question until um, further in the week when we actually have the communique. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I know you don't want to get into. Um you know, a full assessment as to the ongoing talks um, for a ceasefire. But I do, I do wonder if you could just help us understand how this moment is different than it has been in the past a little bit. Um, it was about a month ago that Blinken said uh, in, in, in the region that there are some of the changes um, that Hamas had put forth are workable and some are not. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case or has that changed? Um. I really don't want to. I really don't want to get into that in public, um, uh, only because the secretary we, got into uh, it in public. That was mean? a different time. We're in the middle of some very uh, intense negotiations over this right now. That was when we first received a response back from Hamas uh, that we are characterizing it. That we are characterizing. We are in the middle of some pretty delicate, sensitive negotiations right now about a path forward, and I don't want to say anything that could potentially jeopardize those. So you can't say, or you're not willing to say, if Hamas has dropped any of its demands that were made about a month ago? I, I just don't want to speak to it at all. Okay. And then I know we talked briefly about this yesterday um, with Modi uh, visiting with uh, Putin, but they did make some announcements, um, particularly with regard to continued uh, agreements when it comes to energy and oil. And obviously that is a key factor in fueling um, Russia's uh, war in Ukraine. And so I just wonder how you guys respond to that. You've been previously a little bit reluctant to criticize India um, for importing uh, Russian oil. So as I said yesterday, we have been quite clear about our concerns about India's relationship with Russia. We have expressed those privately, uh, directly to the Indian government, um, and continue to do so, and that hasn't changed. Can I make a follow-up? Uh, have you done so since since this news has broken over the last 24 hours? We have had conversations with them in the past 24 hours, and I think I'll keep the contents of those private. One, one follow-up. Sure, How Go do ahead. you view the Modi putin hugging chemistry as President Zelensky has seriously objected, saying if say, huge disappointment that the leader of the world's largest democracy hugs a bloody criminal in Moscow. This is a devastating blow to peace efforts. Will this create any impact on your trusted and strategic partnership with India? Well, as I said yesterday, we uh, urge India, we continue to urge India to support efforts to realize an enduring and just peace in Ukraine. 
based on the principles of the UN Charter, uh, based on upholding Ukraine's territorial integrity and its sovereignty, and that will continue to be what we will um, uh, engage with Ukraine, I'm sorry, we will engage with India about. Well, on Bangladesh, if I may. Yeah, sure. Uh, at a recent public event, pri ruling Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina claimed that Nobel laureate Professor Yunus was not the founder of the Grameen Bank, and that then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton called her regarding Professor Yunus MD's position with many U.S. officials lobbying for Yunus and threatening her official. She also claimed that the U.S. lobbied the World Bank to cancel its funding for building of the Padma Bridge. Given the facts supporting Professor Yunus as the founder of the Grameen, founder of the Grameen Bank, and the Prime Minister assertion that she stopped meeting with U.S. officials while still, while still trying to secure meeting with the U.S. officials and leadership. Can the State Department confirm the accuracy of these claims made by the ruling Prime Minister? So I don't think I have any comment on that at all. I mean, it's been 12 years, I think, from doing that. 12 years since Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Um, uh, no, I don't have any comment on that. Tom, go ahead. Uh, Tom, go ahead. I wanted to ask you about a story the BBC is reporting today yeah. about Diego Garcia, which is that um, the US government has blocked a legal hearing uh, on Diego Garcia, which was due to be attended by a British judge, British lawyers for migrants who are trapped on the island, uh, who describe themselves as being held in prison-like conditions, and also a BBC journalist stopped uh, effectively by the US from traveling there. Do you have any comment on that? So I did see that story. Um, I looked into it, and I would refer you to the Pentagon for comment. It's entirely a matter before the Pentagon, well, the State our, Department. I mean, it's thoroughly. It's our understanding in the reporting of this, for, you know, in depth for a long time that there is State Department involvement in this process. So I can tell you that I inquired about this before coming out to the briefing, and it is a Pentagon facility. It is a Pentagon uh, matter. State Department often has some coordinating role, but the uh, it is uh, predominantly, if not exclusively, a Pentagon matter. So I'd refer you to them for the comment. They, they do have a briefing this afternoon, so I would. Okay, and could you say anything about security reasons which have been quoted? And, and if not, does the U.S. have anything to hide on Diego Garcia? Uh, I, I will not say anything about security reasons because that is a matter administered by the Pentagon, so it wouldn't be appropriate for me to do so. It's not something I know about, but it's certainly something I, they, can, they can speak to more appropriately than Do you me. have anything to hide on Diego Garcia? <laughs> no, but I, I, I appreciate when I tell you that I can't speak to a matter that has no, that nothing to do with my department. You continue to ask me. Well, <laughs> ask I mean, me. No, no, but it's, I say it is it's Look, so, so hold on. I mean, Just so, there's, uh, there are I'm not saying none of these are legitimate questions. But when, you ask, when you ask me a question like that, that, that you know I have nothing to say when it's a matter but because it's that like, that hold on, it's like coming and asking me about something the agriculture department did and saying, do I have anything to hide? No, no, but I don't have anything to say about it because it's not a state department matter. It's a defense department matter. So I would encourage you, I would encourage you to go to their briefing and ask them questions about it. It's only you did concede the answer that the State Department, in your words, may have a coordinating role. Some small so coordinating role. It is, it is uh, 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 largely, predominantly, if not exclusively, other than some co small role that we often play as diplomats, a Department of Defense matter. So I would defer, uh, I, I would I defer to that. More broadly, on the whole Chagos Island um, the situation with the, with the Islanders, the State Department does play a major role in it because there is a diplomatic uh, you know, thing. There's a dispute going on between um, the Brits and, and uh, Mauritius or, 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 and, and, and the Islanders. And you guys have taken a position. Do you have any guidance on what it, uh, whether that position has has changed or not? I do not. In the past, it has been, this is an issue for those, for them to I, work I out. Do, I do themselves. not have any update on okay. that question. And so while, while we're at it on the subject of um, British overseas island territories, how about the Falklands? Anything new on that? <laughs> no. No, Matt. No? Okay. And, uh, and New Caledonia? Let's <laughs> no. go to France. Let's go to, you know. <laughs> no, we can tour the entire on, world. I mean, on the issue of these dozens of migrants who are trapped, basically in what they describe as, I mean, that is something that you can have a view on because it's something that we know factually has been happening. What is your... I'll take, I can take it back and get you an answer on that. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Thank you. But going back to Ukraine, I have the South Caucasus. Uh, foreign ministers in the building, they had a meeting. Um, at the very beginning, Ukrainian foreign minister, uh, pleaded the U.S. assistance for, you know, rebuilding the hospital. Is this something you guys are uh, entertaining? 
So, as you know, we have provided significant assistance to Ukraine since even before this war and certainly continuing throughout the war. And that war has not just been security assistance, though security assistance gets most of the attention. It also has been economic assistance. Um, you've seen us provide direct support for um, rebuilding the Ukrainian electric grid, as well as for rebuilding other facilities that have been uh, the subject of Russian attacks. So, uh, the meeting was still going on while I, uh, when I came down here. I'm certainly certain it is something that they discussed in the meeting. And as I said, we will have significant uh, military, political, and economic measures to announce over the course of this summit. Thank you. And for the yesterday's attack, do you guys uh, support the calls for uh, war crimes investigation? Uh, so we have uh, long made clear that we support investigations into, into war crimes and potential war crimes uh, uh, committed by Russia and Ukraine. Well, this is very, very episode yesterday's attack. So. Uh, so I don't have anything specific to this, but we have uh, long made clear that we support those investigations, so certainly it would be appropriate here. Thank you. Moving to Georgia, if I may, uh, any comment on the EU's decision today to freeze uh, Georgia's accession uh, dialogue and also funding? Any comment on what? Uh, uh, EU's decision today to freeze all the dialogue and funding. No, I mean, obviously that is a decision made by the EU and something that they can more appropriately comment on, but I know that they have have, have made clear, uh, as we have made clear when it comes to our relationship with Georgia, that there would be consequences for uh, Georgia's democratic backsliding. And where are you at in terms of comprehensive review of this Georgia? On comprehensive review, the review is ongoing. Uh, there's a you know concern in Georgia that now the spotlight, international spotlight is faded, so they're going after the activists, you know, their family members, even their friends. Any comment on uh, how the GD is taking revenge, if you want? Uh, so obviously we would oppose any crackdown on democratic dissent. That's the point that we have been making for some time. It's the point we have made about the passage of this law, and that it would be used to crack down on legitimate democratic dissent. It's a troubling uh, pattern of behavior by the Georgian government that we would urge them to reverse. You can find more from me on uh, Armin Azerbaijan, the secretary, you know, as you know, will be hosting NATO partners and also boss minister will be in town. Is he planning to meet with them? If not, will that be a missed opportunity? Uh, I, don't have, <laughs> I, love, I don't have any uh, announcements to make about, regarding uh, the schedule. Uh, you know that that is always the case. With, is uh, any hope for a happy ending there? What's that? Any, any hope for a happy ending at this point? Uh, we continue to work for um, a diplomatic resolution. Well, well, Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah Russia's foreign intelligence service said um, accused the U.S. of plotting uh, regime change in Georgia, uh, said the Biden administration has already developed a large-scale information campaign to discredit the ruling Georgian Dream Party. How, how do you respond to, to that? So it's completely false. I think it's quite obvious that it's completely false. It's not the first time Russia has made allegations like that in, with respect to U.S. Uh, involvement in Georgia and other countries around the world that have been completely false and have been absurd. And I would just point out the irony of the country, Russia, that is illegally occupying 20% of Georgia as we speak, making those absurd allegations about another country. So, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, I'll be very impactful with your time. I have two questions I'll put to, uh, two together. The Committee for Democratic Bangladesh and not for profit uh, platform of Bangladeshi Americans has written a letter to the US ambassador in Bangladesh uh, regarding legal issues surrounding Dr. Muhammad Yunus. The letter criticized the lack of action from US government and the president of the United States was overwhelmed by Dr. Yunus too powerful American lobby. Uh, trial court uh, in Bangladesh found Dr. Yunus was not paying his own taxes either. What would be a likely response uh, from the US government to, to the concern raised by the committee? And my second question also, what is, uh, I know that everybody was talking about Modi's visit and uh, I, uh, my concern is, uh, my, I want to uh, know your response about what is the US uh, perspective on Indian Prime Minister Modi visiting Russia and Bangladeshi Prime Minister visiting China at the same time? Thank you. So with respect to uh, Dr. Yunus, we continue to monitor closely developments uh, in the case against him. We have expressed for some time our concern that these cases may represent a misuse of Bangladesh's labor laws to harass and intimidate Dr. Yunus. Uh, as a key economic partner to Bangladesh, we also worry the um, perceived misuse of labor and anti-corruption laws could raise questions about rule of law and dissuade future foreign direct investment. Uh, with respect to the two visits, I've already spoken to the Modi visit. I don't have anything to add to what I said. And with respect to the visit to China, look, we understand that countries engage with China. We engage with China. The secretary has made uh, two trips to China himself, so I don't have any further comment Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, two on Pakistan, one on Afghanistan. Um, 
The other day I saw a leg <clears throat> of a human being uh, torn apart with whom I had a dinner here in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago. He was a senator of Pakistan uh, and he was killed in IED blast uh, in the tribal areas where I'm from. Today a captain was killed over there. Uh, you and Vedant both believe that uh, because of the last couple of years, because of Imran Khan, I uh, might have asked a lot of questions about him. But I also ask a question that whatever these decisions have uh, led to is now there is a terrorist uh, war over there where the U.S. military agrees on it, the Pakistani military agrees on it. But because of Imran Khan, the situation has become so confusing in the KP region that uh, it, it, has become, uh, it has become very uh, difficult for uh, uh, the government to take decision whether they should do this operation or not. Do you, have you uh, given any guidance or any support to Pakistan to go ahead with this operation that they're planning to take or not? So first of all, let me just offer my condolences to the, the loss of what um, uh, I understand is a personal acquaintance of yours. Um, and number two, I'll just say that the Pakistani people have suffered greatly at the hands of terrorists, and we have a shared interest in combating threats to uh, regional uh, security. We partner with a range of Pakistani civilian institutions and regularly engage the government of Pakistan to identify opportunities to build capacity and strengthen regional security. Uh, second one is this journalist uh, was killed, and I had asked about him a couple of times as well. Yesterday, the Kenyan court where he went, Pakistani journalist went to Kenya and got killed over there. Uh, my father served the longest uh, term in jail of nine and a half years as well, so I do like to think at least about my journalist colleagues. Pakistan judiciary, do you think is, uh, or any just like general opinion, it's, it's not as bad as Kenya. The Kenyan government has given him the poor journalist justice, but in Pakistan, the guy has not. Uh, can you at least uh, put a word to Pakistani judiciary or the politicians to at least not play with the lives of journalists? You know, uh, I'm not aware of this case, so I'm not going to comment in any way specifically on it at all. But of course, we support the work of journalists around the world. and We think it's important that they be uh, able to do that job, their job safely. Last one, can I ask about no, this no, interview no, about with Taliban, go, please? Go just one last more. one. Yeah, one more. Um, Taliban senior official for the first time did an interview with a Pakistani journalist. The journalist was a former government uh, senior employee, retired, became a YouTuber, and did an interview. In that interview, everything, most of the things were completely lied. Like, for example, the Taliban spokesperson said that there are 90,000 female teachers in Afghanistan. 90,000. Whereas the fact is that 90,000 female teachers are sitting at home getting salary from the government. Now, Vedant last week told me that the U.S. is not supporting Taliban. And 800 million has been given by USAID. 300 million has been given by the State Department in different forms, OK? But what I'm saying is women without education and still a billion dollar receiving and lying on international media that there are 90,000 women teachers where absolutely girls are so, still so without. So get, get to the question, Yes, sir, your mind. thoughts about this whole uh, Girls' education and U.S. support and uh, so, so first of all, no, uh, we do not support the Taliban. As Vedant made clear last week, uh, as um, I have made clear at previous briefings, we do not provide any funding to the Taliban. That is absolutely false. Uh, number two, I do that does, however, give me a chance to comment on something that we saw just today. So you may have seen, because uh, I know you track this issue very closely, that the UN issued a report uh, on. Um, the treatment of women and girls in uh, Afghanistan and so-called moral oversight in Afghanistan. And what we saw is that the unpredictable and arbitrary enforcement of the Taliban's so-called morality, morality code undermines the human rights of all Afghanistans. We continue to monitor closely the Taliban's treatment of the people of Afghanistan, especially their treatment of Afghan women and girls. We expect the Taliban to honor their assurances to the Afghan people and the international uh, community in this regard. And as we have said in public and private uh, to, the to the Taliban's representatives, their relationship with the international community depends entirely on their actions. And we have made that clear, and I think um, uh, uh, have been, uh, as I said, crystal clear about that for some time. Go Thank ahead. you so much. Thank, Thank you so much. You. So we know the US is working for the day after plan in Gaza. Mm -hmm. And for the NATO summit, Turkish President Erdogan and his delegation, including the foreign minister, will be here in town. Is that something you will discuss with your Turkish counterparts, given Ankara has long pledged to 
guarantorship in the region, and we know we hear from the Turkish officials that they are encouraging Hamas to accept the ceasefire proposal. And also, right after Joe Biden announced the ceasefire deal, we know Secretary Blinken and Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan held a phone call yeah. immediately right after yeah. that. So I'd like to hear more on that. Uh, yes, in fact, we have been discussing. Uh, the end of the conflict and what comes next with Turkey for some time. You may recall that Secretary Blinken in January traveled to Istanbul to meet with President Erdogan and with uh, the Foreign Minister Fadan and has had subsequent a number of subsequent meetings with the Foreign Minister to talk about both how we get to a ceasefire and how we um, reach a durable end to the war with um, uh, robust security, governance and reconstruction plans for Gaza. So that continues to be a topic that we uh, discuss uh, uh, on any occasions when we meet with our Turkish counterparts. Should we expect similar meetings on the sidelines of the NATO summit this I, week between I, American and Turkish I just don't. I just don't have any meetings to announce here today, okay. as I've said to other people. Thank you. Yeah, um, so. Just a slightly different thing. Um, the uh, State Department official, Young Pak, uh, who was the acting Special rep representative on North Korea has has stepped down. I believe. Um, is there are there any plans to to appoint a new envoy for North Korea? So first of all, uh, yes, she has stepped down, and we do thank Dr. Pak for her tireless dedication and strong leadership on DPRK since assuming office in 2021. We wish her well on future endeavors. Um, uh, Assistant Secretary Dan Crittenbrink will oversee DPRK policy for the Department of State. Ambassador Julie Turner um, will continue to serve as spe uh, Special Envoy on North Korean human <laughs> rights issues. Uh, Seth Bailey will continue to serve as Deputy Special Representative for the DPRK, and I don't have any additional personnel, personnel announcements to make the, today. The, the, the previous Special Representative, Sun Kim, left at the end of last year, I believe. So. Uh, there are no plans to to, re to fill that role again. Uh, I just don't have any personnel announcements to make today. So, yeah. Thank you so much. As you are hosting a uh, NATO head of state summit here, a week uh, ago, Pakistani Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif met with Russian President Vladimir Putin in Kazakhstan on the sidelines of the summit, and he uh, suggested President Putin that he must consider barter trade as a means to counter Western financial sanctions. And he also referred Pakistan and Russia bilateral barter system trade from 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So how will you respond on that? Uh, I don't have any comment Secondly, on that. Secondly, yeah, uh, with the number of resolutions from the US Congress, number of letters from the lawmakers to President Biden, Secretary Blinken, and uh, number of many other things regarding the Pakistan democracy election um, interference or election investigations, uh, that all these things are believed that Imran Khan followers are backing and they are like asking their representative here to do this. Now, uh, there is a backlash on the Pakistan embassy here. The Pakistani ambassador here, uh, Sardar Masood Khan, he was just removed unusually and he was, he didn't just completed his diplomatic tenure, although he was a political appointee. But this is something like, it is believed in Islamabad he was failed to fulfill the uh, all the things what he was given like he didn't make it ha happen like he didn't stop all these things the resolutions for the uh, that are coming in the favor of Imran Khan so uh, this is something very clearly visible that uh, how the Pakistani democracy is running and who is running it so how do you see this no, I was not aware of that case until you raised it so I don't have any comment go ahead um, this morning uh, on Capitol Hill, the UN Special uh, Rapporteur for uh, Human Rights in Iran was on uh, was talking to some lawmakers and giving a congressional briefing about uh, the various massacres in the 1980s, as well as uh, the contemporary status of human rights in Iran. Um, he, uh, as part of his remarks after the event, he spoke a bit about the Biden administration's uh, policy towards Iran and basically uh, denied or rejected the idea that there is an overarching strategy for Iran that has been laid out by the Biden administration, at least in the UN's view or his view. Um, how do you respond to that? And uh, if, assuming, <coughs> excuse me, ex assuming that uh, the president will be returning to the White House next year, um, can we expect a sort of future of Iran negotiations to be laid out by this administration? So first of all, I would say everyone is entitled to their opinion, but that obviously is very much one that we would not agree with. If you look at the totality of our policy, um, uh, we have made clear that we are committed to 
uh, ensuring that Iran can never obtain a nuclear weapon. We have worked with our allies and partners around the world to, uh, to ensure that objective. Uh, you have seen us impose over 600 sanctions and export controls on Iran and Iran-related entities to counter Iran's malign influence. You have seen us uh, work with partners in the region um, through diplomatic measures to try to counter Iran's influence um, and to take on, on Iran's support for terrorism. So no, it's not um, uh, something I would agree with at all. Gotcha. Um, and one sort of quick second follow-up. Uh, we got official confirmation today that uh, the president is going to be holding a uh, official press conference um, as part of the NATO summit this week. Uh, the, I think they announced that at the White House yesterday. Yeah, so. the, the uh, <laughs> official or unofficial description was it's going to be a big boy press conference for the president. Um, I was wondering if you could c confirm for us whether this is going to be another situation where it's a joint press conference with other leaders or whether this is going to be a standalone thing. So I will let the White House speak to the president's schedule, but I think they made clear yesterday he plans to hold a solo press conference. Gotcha. So with that, we're wrap for today. Thanks.